Hello everyone and welcome to Amanpour and Company. Here's what's coming up. 7.30 in the morning, this town started to burn down. Within three hours, it was gone. Paradise found. As fires rage across California, Oscar-winning director Ron Howard shows us what happens to the people left behind. Then, I cannot leave these people to die. A shocking twist for the real-life hero the world knows from Hotel Rwanda, why he's now under arrest in his own home country. Plus, what I'm hoping that happens through this process is that all of a sudden we see education as one of the most important priorities that we can focus on. Google's global education evangelist tells Ana Cabrera how schools can adapt to the pandemic. And finally, look at me, how Iranian-American photographer Firuz Zahedi got from there to here and helped define an era. Almond Poor and Company is made possible by the Anderson Family Fund, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, the Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Candace King Weir, the Strauss Family Foundation, Bernard and Denise Schwartz, Charles Rosenblum, Jeffrey Katz and Beth Rogers. Additional support provided by these funders and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the program, everyone. I'm Christiana Manpour in London. For weeks, the skies over California have looked like this, an alternative universe, the wildfire blazes bleeding into the heavens. Dozens have raged through California, Washington, and Oregon, scorching millions of hectares of land, killing residents, and destroying homes. And climate change is the gasoline pouring all over these tinderboxes. This same horror show has played out across the world, in Australia, the Amazon rainforest, and even in the Arctic Circle, as extreme weather becomes ever more so. But what happens to people after the ashes settle? That is the focus of prolific director Ron Howard's latest documentary, Rebuilding Paradise, which follows the aftermath of the 2018 campfire there that killed 85 people. Here's a clip from the trailer. Wildfire in history. The town of Paradise is basically ash. I lost my house too. I'll tell you what, it's not easy. No, it's not, but we're alive. It's not just that I lost my house, it's not that I lost my memories. My entire way of life is completely gone. As hard as it is to say, I don't see the town coming back. Ron Howard, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Good to be back. Well, I don't know whether you knew that it was going to be in the news again, but here's your new documentary on the fire in Paradise, California. What made you actually want to do this film on that fire? I knew Paradise. My, my mother-in-law had lived there the last four years or so of her life. I'd been there many times. I, I knew what kind of a town it was. Uh, it's, uh, it, 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 it was, you know, it's not a tourist destination, not an industrial center in any way, shape or form, not even logging anymore. Um, it's a place where people wanted to be, uh, because they just, they just loved it there and they wanted to raise their families there. And, you know, the, like a lot of things, Christian, we, we all see these images, they're horrifying. We feel empathy. We, we do what we can about it or we don't and move on. But, uh, but we move on. And in this case, of course, because it was personal to me, I, I you know, I, my thoughts went deeper. Uh, and I, I turned to our team and said, is this a story to cover? What's going to happen when the news cameras leave? So it has that personal gut punch for you, that personal relevance. But let's just remind people of the facts and figures. I think it's something like 150,000 acres were burned, um, almost all, 95% of all the structures, houses, whatever other structures yeah. were in that town were burned and about 85 people lost their lives in this fire. You also, though, you know, from the very beginning, you have, you know, all these people talking about what it was like to nearly die um, in this raging fire. And yet, you also have them coming back, or at least a certain number of people coming back, wanting to rebuild. I'm going to play a little clip uh, to illustrate that. Town of Paradise permit to build my home. 1552 Forest Service Road. I'm Jazz. Awesome, man. Awesome. This is it. Yeah. Do that, buddy. We're on now. This is the beginning. 
excited. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he said, finally caught up with me. <laughs> wow. <sighs> yeah, it's a big deal. It is a big yeah, deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. Very New big. New beginning. So it's obviously really emotional. They've had a near-death experience, but it's also that American thing that makes people want to rebuild, to stay, and the eternal optimism. What struck you the most about the people there? Well, of course, I knew the people well, or, or not, not personally, but a, a sense of, of, of who they were. Yes, they are these kind of rugged individualists. That's that, that's that brand of thinking, and that is that kind of, a, you know, Americanism there. Uh, so it was... Uh, particularly uh, devastating, of course, when their entire world is uh, is ripped out from under them. You know, the, 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 the definition of, uh, you know, what a productive day is completely changes. And they're very, you know, they're people full of, uh, of pride, as are most people, most places. I think they're, you know, it does beg the question. And I think for them, in many instances, raise the question, what what should we really expect from, you know, from our government? What should we ex expect from uh, government agencies? Uh, wh what kind of help is there for us? There was a sense from people who had been on the fire sa safety committees and so forth that they had done some of what they could do mm -hmm. to uh, try to prevent this, this kind of catastrophe, but not all they could do. Right. They couldn't get all of the ordinances through and so forth. And so there was also a sense of, uh, of, of regret uh, for many people that only intensified sort of the PTSD they were all experiencing. It raises this question about what should we expect from our government. Um, many people, the majority of the world actually who believes in the catastrophic, cataclysmic advance of, of, of climate change, believe the government should be doing a lot more all over the world, but particularly in the United States. You seem to have shied away or deliberately stayed away in this film from making climate change political points. You do have a slightly, a tiny little clip of President uh, Trump who was there, confused the name paradise, called it pleasure. Um, so you put that in, but you studiously stay away, don't you, from, from the climate change aspect of it. Well, I didn't view it as a polemic. To me, it was a sort of a case study. And what does it mean afterward? Let's not politicize why it happened. That That's not really for this film. Uh, I was interested, because many people in the town believe different things. Uh, not what it was about to me. Uh, we, it, certainly a factor, you know, and the science says it, and we say it, but so is the forest management, which we also spend some time uh, talking about as well. In this case, PG&E caused it. They were culpable. They admitted it. In other instances, the horrible fires now uh, are caused by, you know, either fireworks and lightning strikes and other things. So the point is, these catastrophes are happening all around the world. Um, and how, and what does it mean to individuals? I was trying to build a, a sort of a, you know, a sort of a pathway to some empathy uh, for audiences who hadn't really thought about it before. So to that end, and you are a filmmaker, let's not forget, uh, you, you sort of have a little bit of a happy ending solution to this, to this documentary. I, I, we showed the, the gentleman who was getting the permit to rebuild his house, but also you go to a school, you see a new uh, group of graduates. Let's just play uh, this clip. The fact that we are here tonight to celebrate this milestone is a miracle because you survived one of the most destructive wildfires in our nation's history. It left us a different people. You are the first generation of Paradise High School graduates to rise from the ashes of what life was and take a bold step forward into a new and uncertain future. But with what you've been through, you have what it takes to persevere. Congratulations and good luck. Well, 
you know, it's, I guess, your traditional commencement fair, you know, inspiring and invigorating. But he also says, you know, an uncertain future. You've been through such a unique experience. Right now, we're seeing the biggest fire in California history raging. It's been raging since um, the beginning of September. Most of the most deadly fires have happened in California in the last, you know, in the last decade. What do the people who you profiled say about their future? Not just those graduates, but have people seen the film? Yes, they have. They have seen the film, and uh, the response has been very. Positive. I think I think they've, they've they've felt the process of participating in the film, and and I'm grateful in seeing the film to be cathartic, and and um, you know and representative. Uh, look, the town is much smaller than it was. It's going to be a long time before it's twenty six thousand people again. I think it's you know maybe four thousand now. Uh, coronavirus has not been particularly devastating for them, but of course it's a it's a huge factor, and they were they were. They were packing their their things uh, to uh, to get out of there uh, ten days or two weeks ago when one of the fires once again threatened the area. It turned and and uh, and spared them uh, this time. There's a lot of uncertainty. Some of the people that we followed, you know, made it pretty clear they weren't going to stay. I, I found a couple of things that were interesting to me. Um, the people who did want to stay and were committed, they were the ones that kept showing up at the functions. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it was a town meeting, whether it was the, 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 the community memorial service or the Christmas tree lighting ceremony or their, their parade at Gold Nugget Day commemorating the sort of the history of their town founding and so forth. Those people who kept showing up also became the problem solvers in many ways, the ones who did have a shared vision of what they, what they wanted. They weren't always politically on the same wavelength, but they did put that aside and, um, and, and uh, you know, and they kind of beat City Hall. I mean, they, they managed to, 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 to find solutions uh, and it was, all, it was often an, a struggle. And I felt like in, in a lot of ways they were, they were showing us what, what um, problem solving can look like uh, when, when people, you know, decide uh, to come together in the middle and make something happen, something that they um, believe in. So I do think there's a, a note of uh, optimism uh, in that because those people are, are achieving, you know, what, uh, kind of what their new dream is. I, I think, I mean, to me, it sounds like you're describing community, the notion of community. And certainly that has taken a battering in the United States and many other parts of the world as well, but certainly in the United States. Um, COVID, we're now past 200,000 deaths, the biggest death toll in the world. And I know, um, I believe your wife and maybe your daughter as well contracted COVID during the height of the virus. You were in lockdown, but in proximity. I, I, was, I was touched by the fact that you stayed close to your wife um, and you described once she started to get better, you taking socially distant strolls that you described as sort of Victorian era courtship strolls. Tell me what? <laughs> <laughs> what, what was well, that? I was, kind of, <laughs> I was coming back from location. Uh, we just finished filming uh, Hillbilly Elegy in Atlanta, and uh, it was, you know, that all productions were stopped the night we were we were uh, shooting. I came back. She, uh, you know, uh, ha had the fever and was having some of the symptoms, but was not in horrible distress, thankfully. So I was staying in kind of my editing room that I have there in, in, in town. Um, and, uh, and I would, yeah, I just would show up and it was just great. You know, it was great to, to see her. The first time I, when I came home, um, we didn't even do that. It was late in the day. And I just, all we could do is sort of talk to each other through, uh, you know, through the glass, through the glass door. Um, and it was, it was like a movie, you know, with, uh, put holding our hands up and all the, all the corny, all the tropes of, of what you might imagine. Uh, but it was it was really uh, emotional. Thank God, you know, she she navigated it well. Um, can I ask you, I, I am sure you are fed up with being asked this, but you have been around for so long um, as a child actor, uh, you know, then 
movie director uh, and everything, a documentary filmmaker. I mean, I was in Iran growing up when I watched you as Opie on the Andy Griffiths show. And then I was in boarding school when Happy Days was about one of the only things we were allowed to watch. And, and, and I loved it. Well, I had no idea. I had no idea that the, the ultra Americana show, Andy Griffiths show, traveled anywhere outside of the United States. Oh, yes. So that's amazing news. Definitely to pre-revolutionary Iran. But um, so, so let me ask you, you know, you have said, and, I, and I'm interested in this, that there was a time when you felt a little bit threatened by being asked that all the time, that people put that attention onto you. But in recent years, you said, I've come to appreciate my unique place in pop culture. You know, I think that's a very frank statement, and it's a very accurate statement. I just want you to reflect for us. What do you think your place has been, and what has your massively long career contributed, which is a lot? Well, I, I always wanted you know, my adult career to be as a storyteller, as a filmmaker, director, and a producer. I'm a partnered with Brian Grazer uh, at Imagine Entertainment. We make all kinds of shows uh, for, for all mediums, and it's a thrill to be around that. And that's really something that I've always wanted. And I always felt like that there, er, you know, earlier in my life, there was uh, this kind of, uh, this, the, you know, both Happy Days and The Andy Griffith Show, my early work. Uh, it, by referencing it, was it, you know, was it creating a kind of limitation in people's minds as to what my uh, capabilities, creative capabilities might be and, the, and my, my capacity uh, to, uh, to do interesting work, be, you know, beyond, beyond those shows. Uh, well, as I've, you know, as I've been able to do that work and build Imagine and, 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 and make projects that I'm, that, I'm, um, that I'm proud of that are ambitious and, and travel the world making them, uh, you know, I've just been able to realize that I, I hey, I, 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 I achieved what I wanted, uh, and and I probably wouldn't have without that background. So it's not a limitation. It was an asset. It's something that I can really cherish. And now, with many people, I have this kind of, you know, decades long um, uh, relationship that I, I now, I now really value. Yeah. Interestingly, when I was doing the Beatles Eight Days a Week documentary. And I was, it was, we didn't get this on camera, but when we were doing press, I had a very similar conversation with, with Paul McCartney about this. We were walking from one press conference to another. And, uh, and I said, well, you really, you really brought so much through your, through your interviews. I really appreciate it. And he said, it's only been in the last couple of years that I really felt relaxed talking about the Beatles because I was always looking forward. And now I, I, I feel like I can savor you know, um, what, what we accomplished. And so that resonated with me as well. That's, that's a great um, reflection, actually. And lest we, uh, you know, be remiss in saying, there has never been a successful child actor such as yourself who's progressed to be such a mogul. That's what's been written about you, and that's true. You occupy a unique, a unique place in the pantheon. I want to ask you finally, because obviously we're in the midst of a whole new racial reckoning. And um, you've seen, obviously, the, the new Hollywood diversity standards. You've seen what Broadway uh, stars and Broadway writers and theater teams want to recreate there to make it more representative. You know, you won Best Director for A Beautiful Mind. Do you think you could have won it under today's uh, new representative um, demands? And do you think oh. this is going to work, more to the point? Well. Well, that project probably wouldn't have qualified. You're right, uh, and uh, I don't. I don't know the details. It's possible I could work on a project, and they could say, "Well, you don't actually qualify." But I don't think that would be the case because I, I, I do. Um, uh, again, I, it, in my in my heart, I really support the spirit of uh, of what they're trying to do, and I also think audiences are beginning to expect it. And I think that we are a, in a, our own way a kind of a service um, b business. We, we, we have to speak to our audiences in ways that uh, resonate uh, for them. But uh, I, think you're, I think you're right. I doubt if, I doubt if uh, uh, Beautiful Mind would have met that criteria. Um, but I really hope that in a very organic way that all my projects in recent years and going forward would meet that criteria. Well, well that's great to hear from you. Ron Howard, thank you so much for joining us. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Such an impressive body of work. Now, Ron Howard did not make this movie, but Hotel Rwanda did inspire people trying to make sense of the heroes and villains during that nation's terrible 1994 genocide.
Paul Rusesabagina became an international icon for his work saving more than 1,200 people who were trapped inside his hotel there, while machete-wielding marauders stormed around outside. In all, nearly a million people were killed in 100 days. In 2004, Paul's story won Oscar nominations, and in 2005, he was awarded the Medal of Freedom, America's highest civilian honor. It all seemed like your typical Hollywood happy ending. But earlier this month, the whole story turned upside down. Suddenly, he's arrested and charged with terrorism. He was in court again in Kigali, Rwanda, today seeking bail. And joining me to understand this reversal of fortune is journalist and author Anjan Sundaram, who's written extensively about the authoritarian political climate in Rwanda since the genocide. Um, welcome to the program. Uh, can you, this is an extraordinary story. I, essentially, his family is claiming that Paul was kidnapped. He left his home in Texas. He thought he was going to neighboring Burundi to give an inspirational reconciliation speech, his experience with genocide. But that was interrupted, and he was, whatever they call, disappeared back to Rwanda. Tell me how that happened. Yes, so, I mean, there have been conflicting accounts of what exactly happened to Paul, but the human rights organizations that I follow seem to indicate that Paul was forcibly extradited or kidnapped to Rwanda from Dubai. He was en route to Burundi in Dubai, and six hours after he arrived in Dubai, he was bundled into a plane, and uh, by his own account, he woke up in Rwanda. Let, let me just play this little uh, clip. It is actually Paul inside the Kigali prison system uh, and, and court system, giving an interview to the New York Times, but he was surrounded by, uh, you know, the, the law and order officials in Rwanda. Let's just listen to this clip. When I arrived in Dubai, there's someone from Burundi who was, who had hired a private jet, and uh, that private jet was then supposed to take us from um, the Dubai to Bujumbura. It took us from Dubai to Kigali. Well, I was taken somewhere. I do not know where. I was tied, my legs, my hands, my faces. I could not see anything. I don't know where I was. Yeah, after those three days, I have been treated very, very well. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not complaining of anything. So that's interesting. He gives a dramatic account of what happened, and then he says, I'm being treated very well. I'm not complaining about anything. We understand that he was, you know, obviously there were government officials sitting in on that interview. What have you been able to learn? Any more about his treatment? I think one should look at this trial not expecting any justice from it, but rather uh, seeing it as a show of force, as Kagame, uh, show of power by Kagame. And I would look back to the arrest and death of uh, the singer Kizito Mihigo earlier this year. Uh, Kizito won the Havel Prize this year for creative dissent, and he was found dead in a Rwandan prison cell. But shortly after he sang uh, about killings that Kagame had conducted, he was accused of terrorism. Uh, Evidence was produced that can't be challenged or verified in any open or transparent way. And he was produced, much like Rusesa Bagina was, in front of police officers. And he began to incriminate himself. And it became a farcical theater. And I would imagine that some, some similar theater would be forced upon Mr. Rusesa Bagina in Rwanda, uh, simply so he stays alive. OK, so let us just say, in, in, in fact, what the government is saying. They have charged him with some 13 counts of terrorism. And they are saying that it's because of the, um, the, 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 the movements that he started, um, MRCD, which is a coalition of groups opposed to the government. But they say that a movement called FLN, or the National Liberation Forces, is a militia and that he is you know, in charge of that. Um, this is the government. Paul Rusesabagina was arrested in Kigali based on an arrest warrant issued in November 2018. He is, by his own admission, the political leader of the National Liberation Front militia, and in 2018 attacked villages along Rwanda's border with Burundi and killed at least nine civilians. He will stand trial on charges that include funding an irregular armed group, murder, and recruitment of child soldiers. So we've read all of this out because we actually wanted a government official, and this is what we got for them, from them instead. But 
Okay, here we have a, a person played by Don Cheadle in the Hollywood movie Hotel Rwanda, who until now, there was never a chink in his story at all. Uh, and it's more than you know, 25 years since the genocide and since all that happened. He, he was a hero and he went around the world preaching what he learned and reconciliation. Why do you think this has happened? Why is the government saying that he will stand trial on terrorism charges? I think it's happening because Paul Rosisa Begina is such a popular and respected figure for his courageous actions during the genocide, which makes him popular among Tutsis, among Hutus, a heroic figure in the international community, and therefore a political threat to Kagame that Kagame wants to neutralize. And I would emphasize that Rosisa Begina and many other brave Rwandan politician, opposition politicians have tried to engage and challenge Kagame in a free and fair election in a democratic way. But Kagame has uh, taken that possibility away. He's destroyed the democratic process. He won the last election in Rwanda by, with 99% of the vote. And, uh, and so it's become very difficult for people like Rusesa Bagina, who wish to build a Rwanda with a different vision, that, a Rwanda that they believe would be better, uh, to challenge Kagame and to enact that vision. So you've written a lot about it. You wrote a book called, I think, Bad News. You've written a lot about the, the, the political climate in Rwanda. And we, we all, we've seen all those pictures of Paul with all those dignitaries, but you can see equal and more pictures of Paul Kagame with dignitaries from all over the world who have praised him, who've supported him, who have funded him because of guilt, for one thing, but also because of the other indicators that he brought to in, in other areas, maybe not in political areas, but in all the other indicators, raise Rwanda from the ashes of that terrible genocide. It, it, it is a real big dilemma for the international community. What happened, do you think, to Paul Kagame, who legitimately can be praised for bringing his nation into such a strong position in that part of the world after that genocide, but as you say, has a very, very complicated, and, and many human rights organizations say, uh, a very poor record when it comes to opposition, democracy, and, and pluralism, not to mention free expression and journalism. Right. I, I think the tragedy for Rwandans today is that they're living now in a dictatorship, and 26 years ago, uh, they experienced a horrific genocide that was also perpetrated by a dictatorship. So Rwandans today again find themselves in a situation where future violence is more likely, and frankly, they don't deserve that. Um, I think, I think uh, Kagame has received a lot of praise. I think what one should remember is that many dictatorships build schools and roads and hospitals. This is not particular to, to Rwanda. But what unites dictatorships is, is their destruction of democratic institutions that ensure stability. And many dictatorships are followed by chaos and violence. And, um, and that's, that's the situation Rwandans face today, because Paul Kagame uh, has concentrated power in himself. Uh, clearly, his family and all his friends in the human rights space and all his friends in the United States um, in the peace and reconciliation space are, st are standing up and talking um, uh, for him. Paul uh, Rusesa Begini, I'm talking about. His family says he stood up to soldiers and genocidal maniacs in 1994. Today, he stands up against a repressive regime, one which kills journalists, human rights advocates, and political opponents. Here's a little clip of what his daughter said about, about his situation right now. Our father is a human, humanitarian. He's a human rights activist. He has done everything in his power to speak up for the voiceless, to speak up for the people who are not heard and who are, um, who have been persecuted by this government, and um, he's and he has felt the consequences of it. The, go the Rwandan government has gone after him for um, for speaking up. He did not plan on going to Rwanda, um, which is why we, we stand by the fact that he was kidnapped. So again, it is an extraordinary story, uh, Anjam. What do you think is going to happen to Paul? Uh, he's certainly not going to get a fair, fair trial. Uh, as, as his daughter has mentioned, Kagame has destroyed all the democratic institutions in the country, the parliament, the free press, the judiciary. And so what he's going to get 
uh, based on historical events, would be some kind of show trial that brings a, a respected and popular figure like Mr. Rusesa Begina to his knees. And in doing so, Kagame is showing the world and Rwandans his power, the price people pay for criticizing him. Uh, many people around the world, uh, opposition politicians, soldiers, journalists, uh, have been found dead after criticizing Paul Kagame, have been found even beheaded. Uh, many of them languish in his prisons. And Mr. Rusesa Begina, being an international figure of such standing, is just the latest and maybe most dramatic example of Kagame's uh, reach, uh, the fact that he was able to extraordinarily uh, kidnap him in Dubai and bring him to Rwanda when, you know, I met Paul in the United States and he was very careful. He knew very well the dangers that he would face in Rwanda. And one can only hope that he will stay alive. Well, this story and, and Paul Rusesa Begina's profile is very, very high and many people are paying a, a lot of attention to it. Anjam Sundaram, thank you so much for joining me. And now the coronavirus pandemic has thrown education around the world into chaos and forced students and teachers to adapt to new and often frustrating ways of learning. But our next guest says that it's not all bad news. Jaime Kassab spent years at Google working out how technology can be used to improve our learning experiences. Nicknamed the education evangelist, here he is talking to Ana Cabrera. Christian, thank you. And Jaime Kassap, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to have you here. Obviously, this is such a stressful time right now for students and parents and teachers and school administrators. And yet, you say the coronavirus pandemic is the greatest thing that's ever happened to education ever. How do you <laughs> see it that way? Yeah, you know, I, I tend to exaggerate for, for function, right? So, um, so I, I think the education system has been doing an amazing job for a very long time, right? And it is one of those things that was set up to do a, a factory model type of economy where we needed people to follow repetitive tasks. That worked well for a very, very long time. What's happened since is that the world has dramatically changed. And because the world has dramatically changed, we need to look at the education system and make sure that that education system reflects what that new economy looks like. And so because of the pandemic, what we're going to be going through is a whole bunch of new innovation. Because right now we're trying to take the classroom model where a teacher sits in the classroom or stands in the classroom in front of 30 students. And we're trying to replicate that online where there's a teacher on a video and 30 students trying to pay attention. And what's going to happen is that educators and education leaders and researchers are going to realize like this doesn't work. We're going to need to come up with something new. And so I think that's what's going to happen in the next couple of months is we're going to start seeing some real new innovation in the education system. So I think that we needed this kind of push in education or you would have seen gradual change, but it would have happened a little slowly and the world is moving too fast for that. How do you see the first step what needs to happen right now because obviously to get from here to there is a longer process and people are suffering right now and the challenges are very real yeah and and, and look for those of us i've been in the education space for about 15 years and when we launched Google Apps in the K-12, or when we launch Chromebooks, we're still talking about schools with computer labs. And now what we're noticing over the last couple of years is this idea that we need to have one-on-one, -on -one, just like you have a device and I have a device, not just our phones, but a device where we can create things, right? The phone is great and kids have phones, but it's very passive. What we need are devices in kids' hands so that they can create things. And so one of the components that we need to do is to make sure that our kids, our students have access to the technology. And those of us that have been talking about equity in education for a very long time have been screaming about equity in education. And I think now there's a general public recognition that we have some real issues when it comes to equity in education. And so I think that awareness is gonna to lead to a lot of action. The awareness is there, but there's still the logistical challenges, one being sure. funding, right? That's a yeah. huge, huge challenge. We hear from state governments that they're looking at billions of dollars in projected budget deficits right now, 30 yeah. billion in New York, for example, 3 billion in a place like Colorado, and we have Congress deadlocked over another stimulus. And, and yeah. so where does the money come from? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and I think the, 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 we start with the focus, right? And I think schools have always been a second thought, right? And I think, again, back to this awareness thing, not only do we have awareness around equity issues, I mean, I, I have teacher friends who, who are, you know, shopping in a supermarket and people recognize her as a teacher and they walk by her and they say, thank you for your service. Like she's in the military, like there's this recognition that teachers are important, that education is important, that schools are important to our community, as opposed to the second thought or this thing that we just took advantage of. And so I think it starts with this idea that the education system in our community should be the central point. And so I think that what I'm hoping will happen is that local governments, state governments, federal government, and corporations that live in those communities start taking advantage of the fact that we see education or our schools as the center point of our community and that we start funding those schools at the, at the levels that we need so that we have the right educators in place, so that we have the right technology in place, so that we have the right systems in place because everyone is starting to recognize that how important schools are. And look, the, the I, I, money is one of those things that's always going to be an issue, but it really comes down to what our priorities are. And what I'm hoping that happens through this process is that all of a sudden we see education as one of the most important priorities that we can focus on. And that's always been something that we've wanted. And I think it's going to happen now. Let's talk about Chromebook because you have been part of that transformation when it comes to education. Sure. And we are seeing a more widespread use of this kind of device. Um, and you launched this several years ago. I, you couldn't have predicted what was going to happen now with this pandemic. Did you ever imagine the scale in which they'd be used? No. So, you know, when so I, I was at Google for 15 years, focused on education and trying to bring technology and education, mostly because I, I think it levels the playing field. I think it's a great equalizer when it comes to access to information. Information equals education. Having access to that information as cheaply as possible is an important element to this. So that was always been my focus when I was at Google. And so the Chromebook to me was this device that could not just benefit the user, not only did it boot up in five seconds, not only was it cheap, not only was it easy to use, not only could anyone use them, they, they, they were great for the administrator because when you're running a school, most schools are small schools. And so the tech director also happens to be the basketball coach and a history teacher. And, and when you throw 2000 machines into a, into a school, it gets complicated very fast. And so what I saw the potential of the Chromebook was that you could actually scale very fast. So you could have one person literally manage 120,000 Chromebooks in a school district. And that was going to benefit all the students and all the educators because now they had access to all the tools that were out there because everything that we do is now online. And so having access to all those resources, all that research, all those tools was an important element to this. And I think that's what the Chromebook did. You know, we are fortunate where I live for our public school district to be able to issue Chromebooks to every student in the district in order to make this learning remotely work during the pandemic. However, I'm overhearing the lessons and I too often hear the teacher having to brainstorm technology issues with the students right now. So, you know, oh, the audio dropped out. Oh, the link isn't working. Oh, my Wi-Fi had a, a blip. And so I do worry that the quality of education and learning is suffering. Is that a concern of yours? Yeah, but I think the quality of education is suffering more because of what we're teaching students more than the technology. I think, again, the innovation is going to happen, right? So you have those bugs, those things happen, buttons aren't the right place. Those are easy to fix, right? Those are, you know, you, you go to Zoom and you say, hey, Zoom, there's people bombing our, our, our meetings. Oh, let's just set up a passcode. Those things are, those things will get fixed. Those, those like bugs, those things will get fixed over time. I'm more worried about what we're teaching our students, right? Because if what we're teaching students are things that machines can do better, we're failing them. So, right, so you got 45 minutes of chemistry, 45 minutes of history, 45 minutes of math, 45 minutes of literature. That, that's not going to cut it, right? What we need to do is really focus on those human skills that our students need. But I think about my six-year-old and what the skills that I want her to have have nothing to do with subject areas. It has to do with collaboration, problem solving, mm -hmm. critical thinking, the ability to learn, creativity. Those are the things that our students need to know how to do regardless of what the subject is. What you're saying is the importance of collaboration and problem solving. And a lot of yeah. those types of things are developed in the classroom, aren't they? With those interactions between students, the ability for a student to ask a question of the teacher, the hands-on learning that takes place so often. So 
Are you advocating remote learning in place of in-class learning, or do you see it being a little bit of everything? Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's, 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 a, it's, it's a hybrid model, right? It's this combination of learning online, learning because you have a device in front of you, and then going out and doing it. That, that's just the way it's always been. And so going out and, and collaborating and doing it. And look, you and I are having a, a conversation. We're collaborating over this topic. And we're doing it online. Would it be better if we sat in the same place, face to face, and we had that? Absolutely. But we got to we, we got to deal with what we have. And this isn't a long term solution. This isn't something that's going to go on forever. But this idea of learning and then going doing and then learning and doing and what we have in schools right now, what your kids and what my kids have, isn't that my, right? I, I know you. We, we think that kids are in school collaborating, but they're not. They're sitting in, in the classroom quietly listening to someone speak for six hours, and that's not going to get us there. So I'm hearing you say it's really important for students to learn how to use technology. Yeah, we, we've given this generation a pass, right? When I talk to students, I tell them that they've been lied to. We call this generation the, the digital generation. We call them the internet generation. We tell them like, you were born with technology. You just know how to do it. You're natural at it. And it's not true. There's, there's great stuff. Stanford has some great studies that show us that 80% of high school kids can't pick out the the, the fake story out of four stories presented to them. Elementary school kids can't tell you what a sponsored news site is versus a real news site. Like we, we, we have to give them the skills that they need, not just how to touch buttons and how to use it, but how to access information, how to vet information, how to make sense of information, how to know whether something's credible or not. And we've, we've failed this generation because we've told them that they're supposed to be good with technology. And so they don't turn around and ask us a lot of questions because they, we put in their head that, wait, I'm supposed to be good at this, but I don't know how fiber works. I don't know how Bluetooth works. I don't know how the internet works. And so what we need to do is take a step back and really focus on helping them build the digital skills that they need. Let me take it a step further though, because Again, in order to learn, you have to be able to focus on that learning. And again, in the time we're in with the pandemic, there are bigger issues. It's not just access to technology. Uh, a report just out from UNICEF and Save the Children found this pandemic has led to 15% increase in the number of children living in poverty around the world right now. Right. And they say that represents an additional 150 million children who don't have access not only to education, but right. to housing and nutrition and health services, sanitation, even clean water. In fact, the CEO of Save the Children said this, quote, this pandemic has already caused the biggest global education emergency in history. And the increase in poverty will make it very hard for the most vulnerable children and their families to make up for the loss. How do you make sure those most vulnerable children and communities aren't left behind, especially when some families are just trying to survive? Yeah, look, I, I grew up, I'm a first generation American. I grew up on welfare and food stamps in Hell's Kitchen, in New York, back in the 70s and 80s when it was really, when the name was deserved, right, back, back then. And, and I grew up poor. I grew up sometimes many months going by without electricity, some days without food. And so this is personal to me, right? This idea that um, people are growing up like that, that kids are growing up like that anywhere in the world is something that I feel personally. I think that education is the key to this, right? And I think that we should focus on education. And, and I get that this is a terrible thing that's happening to us. But what I, the, you know, looking at this as a glass half full opportunity, the way we're, we need to look at this is that education has to become a priority for us. It has to become something that we focus on because that's the only thing, in my opinion, that helps students get out of poverty is this idea of learning how to do stuff, learning how to skill, learning a craft, learning things. I mean, we have an opportunity because we live in this world now where we have a long tail economy where any kid can pick up a laptop and have a great idea and then start that idea and launch it and have a business running, right? That's the world that we live in. I know you focus right now in your work on equity and diversity and inclusion in partnership with um, higher education institutions and, and school systems. Why do you think communities of color are disproportionately impacted with fewer education resources and opportunities than their white counterparts? 
Well, there's a lot of reasons, and, and we can go back and, and, and we can go back to you know the 1800s to dive deeper into some of these reasons, the structural image, the structural things that we've done in the education system. But right now, the main thing that we can focus on is the funding issue, right? This idea that we fund school, we fund education based on zip codes. That if you live in a great zip code, your school has a lot of money. But if you live in a bad zip code, your school doesn't have a lot of money. And it's all based on property tax. And, and that to me is the number one place that we can focus because it shouldn't be that way. You know, we don't fund other public services like that, right? The, the police department in a rich neighborhood doesn't have better police cars than the police department in a poor neighborhood. They don't have bicycles, right? Like it, it, it's, it doesn't make any sense. And so I think the first thing that we can do is understand that we really have an equity issue. And what it means, and the, the difference, and many people think equity means equality, and that means that you have a rich school district and a poor school district, and we should fund them the same. That's not equity. Equity is understanding that this poor school district is going to need a lot more resources than the rich school district because they're dealing with more issues. And we need to fund those schools appropriately. We need to make sure that the best teachers are there, the best resources are there, the best support structures are there. And that's what equity is. Let me end on this. What is your advice to students who are struggling with education right now? Yeah, so I think, you know, when I think about education, and again, I always, I do a lot of presentations and I always start with this idea that education is what disrupts poverty. And what I mean by education isn't education system. I mean education, making yourself a better person, making yourself smarter. And so with students who are struggling with education, and I was one of those too, right? You don't really find yourself for a very long time. When I talk to students, this is the question. I don't ask them what they want to be when they grow up. That question doesn't make sense anymore. That question is an old world question. The question that I ask students is this. What problem do you want to solve? We're, pro we're natural problem solvers. That's what we are as human beings. What problem do you want to solve? And if you don't know, spend some time thinking about the problem. It doesn't have to be a global problem. It doesn't have to be climate change. It can be how to make cars go faster or how to, how to sell more widgets, whatever that is. But what's that problem that you want to solve? And then here's the important question for every individual person, every individual student. How do you want to solve that problem? How do you want to take your gifts, your talents, your passions and solve that problem? Because there's a million ways to solve problems and tackle problems. And then the last question I ask students is, what do you need to learn to solve that problem? What are the knowledge, the skills and the abilities that you have to have to solve that problem that you're passionate about? And here's the magic of the whole thing is that everything that you need to learn, every skill that you want to develop is out there. And the internet is a huge part of this. So go out, determine what those knowledge, skills, and abilities are, and then go solve that problem in the way that you want to solve it, that you're passionate about, and go do that. And, and that, to me, is what education should be about. Jaime Kassab, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate the conversation. Thank you very much for having me. And finally, we turn to one of Hollywood's most celebrated photographers. After growing up in Iran and attending boarding school in Britain, Firuz Zahidi went from the diplomatic corps to art school to Andy Warhol's interview magazine. Along the way, he became Elizabeth Taylor's friend and favorite photographer and went on to capture images of all of Hollywood's royalty. Zahidi is out with a collection of his best work in a new book called Look at Me, and he's joining me now from Los Angeles. Firuz Zahidi, welcome back to the program. Um, I guess Thanks. I want to ask you with that big, I can see a wall of photos behind you. What took you from a pretty conservative, you know, upbringing in, in Iran to, to Hollywood? I want to read this, this, um, this quote you said once. Hollywood was a safe place where people were colorful and well-dressed. They kissed each other and had happy endings. And you were a little bit obs obsessed with it, right, as a little boy? Well, the obsession came from the fact that in the middle of the 20th century, Iran was going through a lot of political turmoil and, um, you know, very conservative government. And my family was a part of that government. So I, I picked up a lot of tension during the early 50s uh, with what was going on without really understanding what was going on. And I just needed something to take me away from that. And we had movies, uh, you know, the cinemas, we could go to the cinema, and I would see these beautiful images, colorful, happy, um, and I thought, you know, that's where I want to be. I had no idea where Hollywood or America, for that matter, were, but 
I just wanted to be there. And as I grew up and uh, became aware what, where it was, um, you know, I had this thing in the back of my head. I'd like to still go there at some point. And I finally did it. <laughs> Well, interesting, because that brings me, and we're going to show a few pictures of, of some of your iconic work and some of the great stars who you, who you photograph. So we'll, we'll put those up as we chat. But the book is called Look at Me. And I want you to tell me why you chose that title. Um, for three reasons. The first reason is, as a photographer, when you direct someone to at a sitting, you give them directions as to whether they should look to the left, to the right, and then you say, look at me. So you have eye contact. Um, a second reason is when you're working with celebrities and shooting them for magazines or for an advertising campaign, they're doing that in order to promote a film, a music album, or a TV show, whatever. So they want you to look at them too. So they're saying, look at me. The third reason being my very personal, that like, look at me, I made it, you know? I had no idea I would get to this point in my life, but I did. Uh, somehow I managed to get here. Lucky me, you know, just look at me. <laughs> well, I think that's, it's really, it's really interesting that. And, and, you know, you almost are a throwback to a bygone era. I mean, I'm not saying that as if you're a dinosaur, but you know, you worked with a camera and film and when magazines were jam packed with, you know, they were thick, the glossy magazines. Vanity Fair, Vogue, you know, all the other Hollywood magazines. You had all these amazing um, jobs, so to speak. What is the situation like now for that kind of work? Well, it's totally changed since the internet came in uh, to the picture, um, so to speak. Um, you know, I, I lived through the golden age of photography for magazines, you know, 80s, 90s, the early 2000s. Um, there was a big budget, you know, magazines had a lot of advertising, so they could uh, splurge on getting good photographers, good hair and makeup people, fly people around the world to do stuff. But they don't have that budget anymore because everybody's shifted to the internet with, for advertising purposes. Nobody buys magazines anymore. And if you look at them, they're very skimpy, maximum 100 pages maybe. I'm primarily talking about magazines to do with style, uh, fashion magazines, uh, or magazines like Vanity Fair. They really don't have that readership. Nobody goes to a newsstand anymore and stands there looking through magazines and buying one. Everyone just clicks on the computer and goes on the internet. And most of the magazines have switched to uh, having you know, an online magazine. So things have shifted and I'm so happy I lived through that phase and, uh, and enjoyed it and you know, profited from it, not just financially, but you know, what it was was just a unique era to go through. And, and the unique stars, actually, of that era. I mean, we've got, you know, beautiful pictures that you've shot from Meryl Streep, Goldie Hawn, Diana Ross, so many others, and we, we're going to put some of them up. Um, what was your big breakthrough? I know you went to Andy Warhol, an interview. You became very close friends with Elizabeth Taylor, and we've talked about that, and she features in this book quite heavily. But who gave you your first real job? I think, I think it was Tina Brown of Vanity Fair, right? Um, well, what happened was, you know, I had the advantage of knowing Andy and working with Interview Magazine. I had the advantage of having Elizabeth as a friend and a mentor, mentor who took me to Hollywood when she was doing a movie. She took me as a photographer. But once she left and I stayed in L.A., it was really hard. You know, I had to go back to the bottom and, you know, raise myself up to the level I did. And at one point, um, a photo editor at Vanity Fair saw one of my photos in Interview Magazine and decided to give me a break to work with the magazine. So I got an opportunity. I started again, you know, doing little shoots for Vanity Fair. Then they gave me bigger ones, bigger ones. And then at one point, uh, Tina decided that, you know what, I qualify to have a contract with them. Because not only did I do beautiful actresses and movie stars, but I also did other subjects, you know, regular people who didn't look like movie stars. And I sort of delivered with those images too. So she felt I qualified uh, to do both and therefore I got a contract. So I really am grateful to her for that break. 
And of course, you know, she's part of the formidable couple, Tina Brown and Harry Evans, and, and he was the great, a great editor of his time, and he passed sadly. So it really is, does feel like an era that's, that's coming to a close. You also shot the, um, the Pulp Fiction poster, Uma Thurman, famous iconic poster of the 90s. And I just want to ask you, I mean, you're, a, you're an Iranian boy done good. <laughs> I think many in the community can celebrate. Just in one minute, sum up what you want to do with this collection. You want to also tell the story behind the story. Um, you mean the collection of photographs that are in the book? Yes. Or the, my collection mm. of photos? Yeah. Uh, well, this book is basically my thank you to the people I worked with. My thank you to the editors, art directors, the celebrities. It's not so much, um, you know, I, I gave several pages per person in the book because I, I just really wanted to thank them and just relive the experience of those years. I put a bit of a distance between the years. I did all those photographs and now I, I went and did various other kinds of photography. I had exhibitions, what they consider fine art photography. Um, but I thought, you know what, that okay. was a great period of my life. I can't just throw it away. I have to pay tribute to it. And well, so that's why this book. And it's, it's marvelous. Firuz Zahedi, thank you so much. Look at me. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> That's it for our program tonight, and we leave you with a truly trailblazing woman, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who in death crosses one more frontier, making history as the first woman ever to lie in state at the U.S. Capitol. It is America's final formal farewell before a private burial at Arlington National Cemetery alongside her late husband, Marty. Remember, you can follow me and the show on Twitter. Thank you for watching Amanpour & Company on PBS, and join us again next time.